<clears throat> Thanks, Roxana. Wow, that's an intro that's an introduction. I appreciate it. Roxana was always the smartest. That that was always that, that's that's what's absolutely clear and still is. I want to thank Dr. Sharma, Dr. Keeney, and and Dr. Uh, Moran for this uh, incredible invitation today. It is a special day. And what I'd like to do over the next uh, few minutes or so is to really review the totality that we have with transcatheter valve therapy. And we're going to try to understand who is and who is not a candidate today for this uh, important transformational therapy. Now, this is a, a, a bar chart that has been uh, used extensively since the early partner days that delineated how we assess surgical risk. And what Roxana has mentioned in the FDA label is absolutely essential. All of our decisions now are made by the heart team, which is, includes cardiac surgeons. And at least for reimbursement purposes, the cardiac surgeon's note is the one that's important for reimbursement. And we'll talk about all these different categories of intermediate risk, of high risk of, 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 of extreme risk, and then those patients who still are best served with surgical aortic valve replacement. For the bulk of the talk, the two valves that we'll, talk, that we'll be discussing are the Sapien transcatheter heart valve and uh, hopefully any day uh, the Sapien XT, both balloon expandable bovine pericardial valves, <clears throat> a little smaller in their height placed directly uh, in the annulus. And we'll be discussing the core valve data, which is a, and you'll see some live cases for both today, the core valve data is a longer frame. It's made of self-expanding nitinol rather than stainless steel or cobalt chromium. It has porcine rather than bovine pericardium. And importantly, as a difference, it sits in a supraannular location, not at the annulus itself, which means it can be eccentric at the base, which you'll see during the live case. And yet there's, um, uh, there's a full co-optation in a circular fashion for the valve leaflets, which are supraannular. Roxanne has mentioned a very important component of our core valve clinical studies. We used CT for 100% of our core valve sizing. That was a very um, important step for us because it allowed us to have adequate size of the valve for the annulus, and we aimed for an oversizing of the frame to the annulus by about 10 to 20% based on the perimeter. And we'll show some of the implications of that in just a second. Now, there has been a tremendous amount of emotion that has gone into podium talks over the next uh, last uh, several weeks about how these datas all compare. And I want to get away from that fray, and I want to describe each of these trials in the terminology that was used for the initial studies. So where is the evidence base established for transcatheter valve therapy? It's in inoperable extreme risk patients. It's in high risk or extreme risk patients, and we'll talk about this data. There's no question that the transformational trial that performed that changed the entire field of transcatheter valve therapy was the PARTNER B trial, which specifically studied those patients who were deemed to be inoperable or not surgical candidates and compared this with medical therapy, randomized trial. A very difficult trial to perform because, as you can see from this graph, the patients who uh, were given only medical therapy, which included balloon valvuloplasty, had a 51% 12-month mortality rate and an 81%, can you imagine, 81% three-year mortality rate. And that was significantly reduced with the use of the transcatheter valve therapy, the Sapien device in this case, 31% uh, and 54% at three years. So marked reductions in mortality. Now, along with Dave Adams, we had the pleasure of serving as the, as the co-principal investigator for this similar uh, cohort of patients. We called them extreme risk patients, patients who two surgeons felt that the risk of harm was rate better than the risk of benefit in treatment of transcatheter valve therapy. They were elderly patients. They were all symptomatic. They had an SDS risk score of 10.3%. Uh, they had 40% uh, of patients had diabetes. And we characterized in great detail indices of frailty of disabilities and comorbidities. To give you an idea, 87% of patients failed their, their uh, five-meter gate speed test less than, being less than six seconds, which is the index of frailty. Almost 30% uh, uh, of patients uh, were, came from an assisted living center. So, so these patients were truly frail, disabled, and comorbid. And with that, there was a significant reduction in mortality compared to an objective performance goal that was constructed from the partner B analysis 
disease, highly significant, all-cause mortality, or major stroke at one year, 26.6%. So very favorable outcomes. And what we found in this study, which was a bit of a surprise, with the major stroke rate, which had been a limitation of, of prior transcatheter valve uh, trials themselves, was 2.3%. And that could be from better patient selection or better uh, technique or, or better, um, better devices. But nevertheless, for this device, it was 2.3% at 30 days and 4.3% at one year. Uh, the, uh, the, the valve gradients were, uh, were reduced significantly. If we just look at the residual gradient under 10 millimeters of mercury that was sustained out to one year. And in this study, uh, we had a 21% uh, pacemaker rate. Now, the, the other surprising finding in this, in this study is we know the importance of paravalve regurgitation because of proper implantation techniques and sizing the valve with CT. We actually saw a reduction in the moderate or severe paravalve regurgitation rate from 9.1% to 4.3%. Uh, in a paired analysis, over 80% of patients who had moderate or severe paravalve regurgitation at the end of the procedure improved over time, improved over that one-year period of time. And we think that's because of ongoing annular remodeling. We didn't see an important relationship in this study. It needs to be confirmed in larger series of patients with a mild or moderate paravalve regurgitation, although they were numerically higher. Clearly, severe aortic regurgitation after the procedure is associated with a very poor prognosis and needs to be treated aggressively. Well, those were the inoperable patients with sapien and the extreme risk patients with the core valve study. No options really for surgery or harm uh, greater than benefit. Clearly established as a therapy, and for that, both of these devices have an FDA-approved indication. Now, Roxana has mentioned now uh, some of the um, movement now towards patients who are higher risk or increased risk for uh, surgical aortic valve replacement. And we know from the Partner A trial, randomized with a sapien device versus surgical aortic valve replacement, that, uh, that there was some separation of these curves at six months, but by, by one year, two years, and three years, no, um, uh, no difference in mortality, but certainly met all of its non-inferiority endpoints as an alternative. And of course, given the patient preferences, uh, patients would much rather, of course, have a, a lesser invasive therapy, such as transcatheter heart valve versus surgery, and that has driven the FDA approval for this device and the uh, broad application in clinical practice which is estimated to be about 80% of patients who are currently treated with transcatheter valve therapies in the United States. We also learned the important relationships between aortic regurgitation and late-term mortality. We're very aware of that, um, as, we, as all of us, and we do everything we can do to minimize the occurrence of paravalve regurgitation at the time of the procedure. And you'll see some of those techniques with Dr. Sharma um, and Dr. Keeney a, a little bit later. Now, Dave Adams was the principal, investigator, principal surgical investigator. We, uh, two weeks ago, we published uh, this article in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, which described uh, our uh, randomized trial of patients who were deemed to be at increased risk. The criteria that, that, uh, that uh, Roxana read are exactly as what we used in our clinical trial, greater than 15% estimated 30 days uh, mortality risk. We randomized those patients to either surgical aortic valve replacement or to, uh, to core valve treatment. The demographics uh, were similar to what you saw in the high risk, except these patients had an STS risk score of 7. Uh, that was a little lower uh, than was seen in the partner uh, A trial. Nevertheless, they were highly symptomatic, had diabetes, prior strokes, and severe lung disease uh, to render them high risk. These are the all-cause mortality results um, at one year with the surgical aortic valve replacement and the core valve uh, uh, transcatheter valve th thamen. The one-year mortality for all for all cause mortality was the primary endpoint. It was 19.1% in surgical patients and 14.2% in those patients treated with the core valve therapy. That was P of less than 0.01 for non-inferiority and using a closed test analysis, uh, one tail uh, P test, which was the predefined uh, superiority testing. Uh, sequentially, the p-value was 0 0.04. So we were very concerned, of course, that there might be some catch-up in terms of the mortality rates over time. We've looked at the initial uh, 60 patients or so uh, and then have added in another 200 patients. Um, all the information that we have available to us today, to date, uh, suggests that these curves have remained separated out to two years. And of course, these will be presented uh, next year at this time with our two-year uh, results themselves. An important component of this trial with the self-expanding core valve therapy was a numeric reduction in the occurrence of all-cause stroke compared to surgery, a numeric reduction compared to surgery, 4.9% at 30 days versus 6.2, 8.8% at one year versus 12.6%. This was with careful NIH stroke skill neurologic examination before and after the procedure. 
The echocardiographic findings were as we uh, expected, a uh, mean gradients of all under 10 and significantly lower than surgical aortic valve replacement. And we saw the same favorable remodeling that occurred of the, uh, of the moderate regurgitation over time in this study. So by Sanjay Call, who's a critic um, of, of, of or a, a critic is a strong word, is a uh, advocate of appropriate statistical analysis, is maybe a better way of putting it, of all clinical trials, drug and, uh, and devices, has put this tr uh, chart together uh, with respect to the high-risk cohort, 49 fewer deaths, 72 fewer mating bleeding events, 91 fewer cases of acute kidney injury, 168 fewer cases of atrial fibrillation, 38 fewer strokes, although not statistically significant, shorter hospital stay, and avoidance of surgery at the expense of about a 20% increase uh, risk of pacemakers, 48 more vascular complications, and uh, more moderate or severe paravalvular regurgitation. So given this, of course, the benefit clearly exceeds the risk, and Roxana gave you the good news. Now I want to walk through what this means in our clinical practices and how we use this therapy. Uh, we have an expanded use protocol within the core valve group that studies the, the uh, core valve in surgical aortic valve failures. This is a case of a 56-year-old woman who had an aortic dissection uh, in 2008, had a debranching graft procedure, a bentol, a sending uh, aortic root replacement and placement of a Soren Mitroflow uh, valve uh, with coronary reimplantation. Obviously, the surgeons who did this operation in 2008 saved this woman's life, debranched her, all of her uh, great vessels, reimplanted an ascending, uh, ascending aortic arch, reimplanted her coronaries, and placed in a, a prosthetic valve. Uh, this is a picture of the Soren Mitral valve. That this valve is a little different than most of the surgical valves because the bovine pericardium is on the outside of the stent frames themselves on the outside. That has some implications with coronary occlusions as we talk about uh, transcatheter valve therapy. Uh, she represented to us in class four heart failure symptoms. Uh, she was not a surgical candidate by multiple surgeons in Boston because of a frontal lobe stroke um, due to cerebral aneurysm and the concern for full um, uh, anticoagulation and the duration of the procedure. Her TE showed a Mean gradient, mean gradient of 85 millimeters of mercury, peak velocity 5.7, valve area 0.6, and a ejection fraction of 60%. And here's the challenge. You can see from this uh, ascending aortic root reconstruction that in the prosthetic graft here and the prosthetic graft here, there's redundancy of the graft, which created a kink. <clears throat> there was no effective way to, uh, to approach this patient <clears throat> from a transfemoral uh, route. This is the real value of the heart team assessment. Our heart team included uh, Car uh, Kamal Kabaz and, and David Liu and Roger Laham, myself, and uh, Dwayne Pinto all meeting together to say, how are we going to adequately treat this patient? We went with a direct aortic approach through the prosthetic uh, ascending aortic root. This is the aortogram uh, that, uh, that, um, that we performed before the procedure. Because of the risk of coronary occlusion with the Soren uh, mitral flow valve, we protected the coronaries with a balloon down into the left circumflex artery and withdrew the catheter. We then uh, placed the 23 millimeter core valve device across the valve. There was um, a residual gradient, which is not uncommon for these very narrowed uh, inner diameter frames uh, with the Soren mitral valve. Uh, we used a, a, uh, a balloon, a Loma Vista balloon, to expand out the inner portion of the frame and left her with a 20 millimeter residual gradient. She has done fantastic over the next nine months. Again, things that we could do now with our multidisciplinary team that we could never have done three or four years ago with this technology. Well, we have to, we have to uh, you know, talk about where we're going with our ongoing trials, and where is there still clinical equipoise? Well, we still don't know about the intermediate or moderate risk patients, and we have randomized trials that have, 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 are, are going to teach us about that. Um, it's important that we don't apply our feelings about um, the benefits of transcatheter valve therapy and that we pour, uh, perform the randomized trials that need to be performed, and there's two of them. And they're a little different. One is the PARTNER uh, 2A trial, which takes patients with an STS risk score of greater than 4% and randomize these patients to either surgical aortic valve replacement with cabbage if needed versus transcatheter aortic valve therapy with PCI as needed. The trial recruitment for this has been completed and follow-up is ongoing. 
um, here at Mount Sinai, um, uh, we're all, you're also participating in a trial called the Sotavi trial, which I think is probably better characterized as a moderate risk design, uh, recently changed uh, by the FDA and now uh, uh, now um, being um, working through the IRB processes at um, most of most of the centers across the country, where it's a heart team assessment, a heart team assessment of a three percent or greater risk. So not tied to an STS risk score, multidisciplinary meeting, heart surgeons estimating that the risk for 30-day mortality is 3% or greater. Um, and that, that's an important step forward. We'll talk about the implications of that in just a second, but a very, very um, uh, big step forward for us uh, in terms of recruitment. We'll, we'll recruit about 20, 2,200 patients for this. So although it's now preferred, it's really not indicated, and we need to complete these randomized trials to get the information we need. And I know your patients here will also be considered for the Sertavi trial, and I'd encourage you to encourage their randomization. Well, where are we uncertain with our benefit? And there's clearly areas where we're uncertain. And probably the biggest uncertainty and benefit is in those cohort C or those feudal patients. And we've really learned a lot as interventional cardiologists about futility. And, and I look at it kind of in, in two different ways when we're making patient assessments. One is that there's normative futility, and that's where medical judgment of futility is made when a treatment that is seen to have a physiologic effect, but is le believed to have no benefit. Well, so what is that? What, what does that mean? That means that, that there are some patients where we're going to fix their valve, but their lung disease is going to compromise their mortality over the next year, or their severe frailty, or their poor nutritional status, or their inability to care for themselves. And the second is physiologic futility, and that's where we, we actually uh, put the valve in, but it doesn't have a physiologic effect. And those, those areas now where we're studying, those are the low gradient, low output, um, is, is one example, where, where we're, we're not quite certain that if we replace the valve with low gradient, low output, particularly those that don't augment with dobutamine, that there'll be a physiologic benefit as, as a result of that. So we're still struggling with these fertilities, but most of it relates to the comorbidities uh, that the patients carries with them. And we learned from the partner B analysis that, you know, as with all the limitations of the STS risk score, probably it does have some value in those patients that have an STS risk score of greater than 15 because really there was no benefit of transcatheter valve therapy versus medical therapy in patients that had a greater than 15% uh, um, STS risk score. So, so multiple, multiple comorbidities, frailties, and disabilities, we have to think twice about performing this. And certainly now we have to understand, well, what, what percentage of the population will we be treating um, in low risk? Well, as it turns out, the vast majority of patients um, still get surgical aortic valve replacement and should, uh, pending our randomized clinical trials. However, when we talk about isolated aortic valve replacement and we talk about STS, which, is, which are going to be two or greater, that may co be comparable to our heart team assessment of, of three or greater, that that's still about 50% of patients in whom right now surgical aortic valve replacement is still indicated. So, so I think that, that surgical aortic valve replacement is still here to stay, still will be cared for for the majority of patients, particularly until we have our, our um, uh, moderate or intermediate risk uh, data available to us. So what are the next generations of heart valves? Just kind of a parade of what we're going to see in the United States in the next year. We'll see have seen Sapien 3, uh, a balloon expandable uh, porcine pericardial valve with the, with the ceiling skirt, reductions in perivalvular regurgitation. Uh, we'll see uh, in the next several months, the core valve Evolute, which has better uh, shaping and sealing of the, of the annulus, a little bit reduced height. Uh, we'll see the direct flow medical, which is uh, a non-metallic uh, prosthetic heart valve, which will be uh, 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 beginning its clinical trials here and has started its clinical trials in the United States. We'll see the portico device, which is a self-expanding nitinol frame, although it looks like the core valve device, it's quite different because it has a bovine pericardial valve located at the annulus. Um, and we'll see the Lotus system, which is a mechanical expansion of a nitinol, single nitinol loop and nitinol frame. Frame, uh, aim to have a ceiling skirt, reduce paravalvular regurgitation, and have good uh, good outcomes. So all of these will certainly be beneficial in reducing the major limitations we have now, which are paravalvular regurgitation and pacemakers, and we're looking forward to both those in the future. So why not for everybody? Well, because we don't have the clinical trial data. But what we do have now is a clear evidence base for inoperable patients, for extreme risk patients, for high risk patients, and for increased risk patients. And, you know, in totality, that's going to be your surgeon's estimate a 15% or greater surgical risk, and that's great. 
we're learning now about the inter, uh, intermediate and moderate risk patients, and certainly we know where there's no benefit. But as Roxana has said, we're very excited that now the two valves are on equal footing uh, with the FDA approval yesterday of the core valve device. Thanks for your attention.